or drug chapter. So we're really talking about substance use and misuse. And so there's a lot of things that go into this. We're going to talk about drugs and, and, and those things and, and look at those. But we're also going to be doing it under the guise of the misuse of drugs um, and possibly other things as well. So where we start this conversation is the conversation of addiction. Okay. So with addiction, um, we talk about addiction, dependence, and abuse. Realize that there, there are many factors that go into developing an addiction, dependence, or an abuse. Um, it, it, it's not just one thing. It's multifactored. We can't pinpoint it to one thing. Um, and we'll talk about some of the things that make us more at risk for these. Um, but at the end of the day, we also need to realize that even though we use addiction and dependence uh, very similarly, there are different things. Addiction is a feeling that you can't continue. Sorry, an addiction is feeling like you need something in order to be able to function normally. So um, someone may feel like they have to have um, a cigarette in order to be able to function and get throughout their normal day. Well, do they actually need that cigarette um, in order to be able to function in their day? No, but they feel like they have to have that. And so that's an addiction. And a, a dependence, on the other hand, is where we actually need something in order to be able to function normally throughout the day or to do the things that, that we need to do. Realize these, these do go together, um, that usually with addictions, they start as we try something or, or somebody tries something and they feel like they need it, they, they like the feeling, and then their body gets used to it and they feel like they need to have it in order to be able to function normally. And then after an extended use of this, it can actually lead to a dependence. So um, a person who uses meth, uh, after an extended period of use, they may actually have trouble functioning normally and actually have some trouble uh, with various things in their body if they don't have that drug because their, their body has become uh, dependent or used to it being there and can't function without it. Now, we can teach the body to function without it um, afterwards, but um, it is definitely something uh, that could happen um, when we look at that. So um, that dependence is there and it is something that we do want to consider. So um, we have that going on when, when, when we look at those dependence and addictions. Realize they don't always go hand in hand. We are addicted. You can be addicted to all kinds of things, but dependency not always. So there can also be things that we're dependent on um, that we're not addicted to. So all of you right now are dependent on air. You need that in order to be able to live and function normally. But no one ever like walks outside and is just like, takes in a deep breath and it's like, oh man, you feel that. Like it's good for the bones. Like I'm so addicted to it. Like just craving it, like that type of thing. Um, and then finally, usually what goes along with this also is abuse. And so abuse is using something in an unintended way or not as the directions follow. So uh, some things, there may not be an intended use for it. So it's always abuse, such as methamphetamine or, or typically heroin would be considered something there is no prescribed use for or, or use for it. Um, but then there could be things like, um, you know, chemicals under your, your kitchen sink. Well, it has an intended use. And if you drink that instead of using it to clean with, that would be considered abuse or realize most people have abused, um, things like Advil or Tylenol, uh, Advil on the, the direction say that you should take two pills every four to six hours. Well, if you ever took, um, two pills and then three and a half hours later, you took two more, that would be considered abuse. Or if you took three, um, I've seen that a lot where people take three of them may they have a really bad headache or they're really, really uh, hurting or something and they take three. Well, that would be considered abuse as well. And so when it comes into this addiction and dependence, it's really hard for uh, people to tell you whether you are addicted to something. I mean, there are indications and we can kind of uh, say those things, but um, I'm not qualified to tell someone if they're addicted to something. Uh, there are people that are that way. And so what we do is we have this um, list of things right here that are indications of an addiction. So it doesn't mean that you're addicted just because um, you use something in large amounts, but the more things you can say yes to on this list, the more likely it is that you'll be addicted to it. And so we'll talk about these things on a list and we'll use some extreme examples, not because we're making fun of it, but just so that it kind of, you see um, and can identify with these examples. And then just realize if you think of any behavior in your life, the more things that you can say yes to on this list, the more likely it is you're addicted or dependent to it. So say yes to one or two, maybe not. You say yes to most of the list, maybe like 10 of them on here. 
well, cool. That might be a big sign that you are addicted. So the first one is tolerance. Tolerance is um, it taking more of something to get the same desired effect. So tolerance is it takes more of something to get the same desired effect. So if you think about, um, you know, if we talk about drinking alcohol, for an example, so I don't know what your ages are and I, I don't really need to know, but um, maybe you've had a drink in your life or you've known someone who's had the very first drink of alcohol in their life. Um, most people, when they drink alcohol, they're looking for something called this buzzed feeling, kind of uh, this, this feeling kind of where uh, everything feels good or, or that type of thing. Um, and someone with their first drink, uh, you guys tell me how much alcohol or how many drinks did it take them consuming before you, before you or, or, or that person you know of felt that buzzed feeling? How, how many did it take? Not a lot. Yeah, not a lot. Maybe it took, you know, a drink, like maybe one beer, like half of a, of a wine cooler or something crazy like that. And, and they're walking around stumbling. Like, Ooh. And then after that person drinks for a period of time, maybe uh, they drink more and more. Or as I like to call some people in college, they at the end of their college career, are expert level drinkers. Um, and the fact that they can, they've drank a lot and really know what they're doing there. Um, how much alcohol may it take now or take that person after a few years worth of drinking um, to get that same buzzed feeling? Would it, would it take more? Yes. Yeah, it would typically take more and take a lot more. Maybe it takes three, four, five drinks to get that same feeling as before. And so that's tolerance. As it takes more and more, that concentration gets higher and higher in your body and you're more likely to become addicted to it. Um, you then have withdrawals. Withdrawals are physical symptoms from not having something. Um, and so if an alcoholic, so someone who's addicted to alcohol, uh, comes off of alcohol, they, they, just, they just stop drinking, they may start to shake. They may start to vomit or have problems concentrating. These would be symptoms of withdrawal, so physical symptoms from not having it. Um, a, a heroin addict may have a heart attack from not having it, so physical symptoms from not having it, and so this would be a sign of an addiction. Um, if you use large amounts, especially when compared to other people, so if someone is using cocaine, and so everyone in this group is doing cocaine and everyone does one line of cocaine and then you do three lines of cocaine. Well, that would be a, a large amount compared to other people. You're using more than other people to get that same effect. And so um, that could be a sign that you're addicted. If you have a persistent desire to quit but are unable to. So you're always wanting to quit. You're trying to quit. You're trying to stop smoking, but you just can't seem to do it. That could be a sign of an addiction. If you spend a great deal of time on it, um, so um, maybe you spend a large amount of time, especially when compared to others, or just if you look at your life, like the number one thing you're doing is this behavior, well, cool, that could be uh, addictive, uh, a sign of an addiction. Do you reduce other actions could be another sign. So maybe you... Um, stop eating. Maybe you stop uh, going out with people. Maybe you stop going to, to different kinds of events that you used to enjoy going to, or um, maybe you stop doing your laundry. So even that type of thing uh, could be a sign that there is an addiction. Um, so we've gotten that. If you, again, continue to use after its knowledge of effects. So if you continue to use after its knowledge of effects. So um, maybe you know it's bad for you and you just are like, well, you know, that's fine. I'm going to continue to use it. So an example of this is uh, there's a guy I know. His name was, was Sean Ron. That should tell you everything about it. His, his full, like everyone calls him Sean Ron. That should tell you enough about him. Um, and so we were all hanging out one day and, and some of the guys in this group that, that were there smoked and Sean Ron was giving them a hard time and saying, why don't you just put it down? And, and one of the guys said, well, I bet you $100 that you can't start smoking today, uh, smoke for 30 straight days, and then put it down at the end. If you can smoke for 30 straight days, and at the end of that 30 days, just stop smoking altogether, um, I'll give you 100 bucks. And if you can't, you owe me 100 bucks. Well, everyone in the group was thinking like, that's a dumb decision. But before we could even think or say anything, Sean Ron said, deal, picked up a cigarette and started smoking. Um, and so we all thought that's probably what you're thinking right now. What well, that's a dumb decision, right? Because, um, not only is, uh, he doing something that may not be great for his health, he's going to spend a lot of money. So let's say he is successful at this and he does smoke for 30 days and quits at the end of it. 
Well, he's going to win $100, but he probably spent $100 on cigarettes in that 30 days. So uh, Sean Ron smoked for 30 days. Um, and then at the end of that 30 days, surprise, surprise, he didn't quit smoking. He literally walked in that day and, and handed this guy $100. So not only did he cost himself $100 in this bet, he, he picked up a new habit. And so he started smoking. Well, a few months goes by and, and see Sean Ron and he's smoking again. And I kind of kind of talked to him and said, hey, why don't you quit? You, you know that's bad for you, right? And he listed off probably a thousand things of why he shouldn't smoke and why it was bad for his health. But yeah, he said at the end of the day, like he just enjoyed it. And so he continued to smoke. Even to this day, he continues to smoke. And so um, that is one of the things that, that we have to kind of look at um, is a continued use after its knowledge of effects. So uh, we also have craving. So if you crave this particular thing, so if you're sitting there and all of a sudden you're like, mm, man, um, maybe you're sitting in the middle of class and you're like, you know, it'd be great right now, some crack cocaine. You know, if you're craving it, if you're just sitting there doing nothing, you're saying, you know, it would be the best thing right now. That could be the sign of an addiction. Um, failure to complete other obligations. So maybe you stop going to work. Maybe you uh, stop coming to school and you fail to complete assignments or tests or things like that because of this. That could be the sign of an addiction. If you try to reduce your use and are unsuccessful, so maybe you try to go from um, maybe you're smoking marijuana uh, three or four times a day and you're just trying to go back to one or two times a day. That could be an example of uh, something that may indicate that you have an addiction. Again, the more of these you have, the more likely it is to happen. And then finally, uh, use at inappropriate times. So there are some things out there that we can be addicted to that maybe there's never quite an appropriate use, right? There could be an appropriate use for uh, alcohol, I guess, of maybe at a party or, or some event. Maybe you're toasting um, someone's celebration. You have a little bit of champagne with alcohol in it. Okay, people would consider that an appropriate use. However, um, maybe we talk about heroin. There's not really an appropriate time to use heroin. No one's ever going to say, oh, that's the greatest time to use heroin. But maybe it's a place that's more inappropriate than others. So if you're sitting in the middle of church service on Sunday and you start shooting up heroin in the, in the pew, well, that would be an indication that maybe uh, there that you had an addiction because that's not the greatest time to use. Or if you're in the middle of class taking your final exam and you pop open a beer, during the middle of that final exam. That would be another example of inappropriate uh, use at times. And so all these things just indicate that you may have an addiction and are things to look at and to consider. But, but the more, li more of these you say yes to, the more likely it is. If it's only one or two, maybe not so much so. So we have all of these things going on and we've talked about addiction and dependence and we've used drugs as the example and we'll talk about the drugs. Um, but at the end of the day, can we be addicted to things that are not drug related? Yeah, we can. So what are some examples of things that maybe we can be addicted to that aren't drug related? Like what, what kinds of things could we be addicted to that aren't drug related? Could it be like cell phone use, like things like that? Yeah, so uh, it could be cell phone use. I see things like self-harm, video games, uh, soft drinks, or just drinks in general, gambling. All these are great examples of things that we can be addicted to um, that maybe aren't drug-related, but they can have the same kind of effects. And, and again, looking at this particular kind of list of things is a good way to indicate that. So um, when we look at it, addictive behaviors, there are plenty of non-drug addictive behaviors like the internet usage. Um, most of you guys, including me at the current moment and with the way that everything's going at the institution, um, internet could be one of those. Um, where think about it, if you crave it, if you ha use it at inappropriate times, um, unsuccessful at reducing use, uh, one of the things that could come along with the internet is your cell phone, as you said, like think about people and their cell phone use could be buying things. Some people are addicted to simply just buying things. Uh, QVC helps with that, but you all have a house you probably drive by that has, you know, 500 Amazon boxes outside of it every day getting delivered. And so maybe that person just likes buying, even if they don't use those products. Um, could be gambling, um, for sure. All different types of gambling could be exercising. Uh, I talked about a guy named Pretty Paul at one point in this class. Uh, Pretty Paul was addicted to exercising and the fact that he went to the gym two or three times a day for an hour or two each time. And so he was really just addicted to, to that exercise. 
There are people addicted to eating, uh, people addicted to video games of all different types, and realize these can even be just as harmful. There was a guy, this was a number of years ago, who was addicted to gaming, and he was sitting in his computer gaming, and as most people that are really um, into gaming do, they may have food and drinks around them, so they don't really have to get up. And this guy had been playing for 12, 14, 15 hours and been drinking things like Red Bull and energy drinks and eating. And most of us um, at this point would have to go to the bathroom. And so we'd simply get to a stopping point in the game or pause the game and, and, and go to the bathroom and urinate. Well, this person uh, ignored that urge and he kept ignoring that urge and kept ignoring that urge until the point where his bladder became so full that it ruptured inside of him because he refused to go to the bathroom. Um, and it actually wound up killing him. Like his, his, it killed him when his, his bladder ruptured. And so these can be very big things. Some people are addicted to TV. Um, and then even more so, um, you could be addicted to working. Uh, some people, uh, most of you guys are probably not addicted to working right now, but you can probably think of someone who is. Um, again, go back and look at these things that may indicate an addiction. So maybe they use large amounts of it. They use it inappropriate times, maybe checking their emails uh, when they're on vacation. Um, failure to complete other obligations, reducing other tasks. Um, and so this gets something very easy to happen when you get into a career that you truly love and are trying to work your way up in. After you graduate college, you can start working and working a lot of hours and, and enjoy what you're doing and you're trying to work your way up and it quickly becomes an addiction where you feel like you're always having to do that. And so uh, these are some, some examples Realize when we talk about these addictive behaviors, you can almost be addicted to anything now, uh, truly. There's a show on MTV, I don't think it still has new episodes, but you can probably find it called My Strange Addiction, where people are addicted to all kinds of things from eating laundry detergent to sleeping with their hair dryer to eating emery boards or nail files. Um, makes a terrible sound when you eat a nail file. And that's the reason that show no longer comes on uh, my house um, is because of that terrible noise. But you can be addicted to anything. And where at the end of the day, we might not always understand them. Like there's a lot of addictions that I saw on that show that I just don't understand how they got started. Like a girl eating laundry detergent. I, I don't know how that starts. Like how you start that. Like, oh, I'm going to try it and, and like it. But once you're there, um, typically there you're kind of addicted to it and dependent on it. And so you may need help to get over those. And so we'll talk about some of those as well. So we've got the non-drug behavior. So where now we want to talk about is kind of the drugs that we can be addicted to. Typically when we look at the drugs that we can be addicted to, there are, um, let's see if I can get the whole thing on here. Yep. There are typically six categories that we, we kind of refer to as our drugs. Um, we'll talk about a couple of others as well. Um, but our, our each category has a set of drugs that we'll list in there. It'll have some street names, which are really out of date because street names are meant to hide um, kind of what people are talking about. So people can talk about on the street without everyone knowing what's going on. Uh, we'll point out a couple of those. Um, and then we'll look at short-term and long-term effects and talk about overdosing on them as well. So realize most of the drugs that we're going to talk about in, in this particular list on this page um, do serve, most of them can be used medically. They can serve some type of medical purpose. Um, and so that's a, that's a good thing, um, but not necessarily all. We'll point out a few of them that, that aren't, don't really have a medical purpose, but pretty much all of them do. Um, and so if they're used appropriately, uh, they can be helpful, but it's when they're not used appropriately that they become more of an issue. So our first category would be opioids. Opioids include things like heroin, opium, morphine, oxycodone, hydrocodone. And so with these particular things, um, they're usually referred to as painkillers. They, they're derived from the opium plant that was typically grown in Southeast Asia and now it's grown throughout the entire world. Could be referred to as things like age, junk, smack, uh, black stuff, uh, oxys, uh, OC, Captain Cody, all kinds of different things, but they're all uh, painkillers, and you'll recognize things like morphine are used in hospitals. Um, heroin and oxycodons um, can be used as that. Um, heroin, even though most people think about it as just a drug, um, in very severe scenarios, uh, in a few cases, especially in other countries, heroin has been used as a, a pain relief drug um, when it's absolutely necessary. And so when these things are used appropriately, um, there was a study done that actually allowed for the use of heroin as a, um, a pain relief drug under certain circumstances. 
And so when this was done and used appropriately, people can have heroin and it gets rid of their pain. It's, it's a little bit better than morphine. Uh, but at the end of it, people that were given heroin to treat their pain, when it was used appropriately, actually uh, showed no addiction or cravings or even cared to have the heroin again uh, when their medical treatment was over. And so we know this with most drugs, the body has protective mechanisms in place to keep us from getting addicted when it's actually needed. It's when we use it when it's not needed that these things can become a little bit more addictive. So short term, uh, it does uh, relief of pain and anxiety, gives a euphoric feeling, can kind of make you feel like you're on clouds and just kind of drifting um, there. Um, it can cause vomiting and respiratory distress, depression, uh, lowers your inhibitions and your responsiveness. Uh, long term, it can cause brain damage, and some of these are given intravenously, so cardiovascular disease, uh, premature uh, births and, and birth defects, and so lots of things going on. Um, at the end of the day, opioids, when they're given in high doses, if you're going to overdose on an opioid, it's typically going to be that you stop breathing. Um, you just, your body slows down and you just kind of forget to breathe and then basically suffocate while you're unconscious. Uh, and so that's one of the things you have to worry about. Uh, the next category we've got is central nervous system depressants. And so this would be a whole category called downers. So if you ever heard of a downer, this is a central nervous system depressant. These are things like berubates, benzodiazepines, which include Valium, Xanax, or fentanyl, methoqualin, GHB, um, uh, called things like yellow jackets, candies, downers, tranks, forget me pills, uh, called roofies as well as in this category. So rufentanil is a roofie, um, quades, ludes, grievous bodily harm, that type of thing. Um, all of these things bring your nervous system down. They slow you down. They kind of put you in slow-mo. They make you relax. You move slower, lowers your inhibitions. Um, you think slower. You kind of just think about like you're going to get you just want to sit in your couch and like, just relax. These are what those downers are for. Uh, they can reduce anxiety. They, they can make you more irritable and abusive. Uh, they impair muscle movement. It causes drowsiness and loss of consciousness. Um, we know that long-term they can make it really hard for you to, they can cause insomnia and make it hard for you to fall asleep without them. Uh, again, brain damage, birth defects, um, all different kinds of things going on in that route. If you overdose on, Downers, typically what's going to happen is uh, just like opioids, you're going to literally stop breathing. Your, your body's slowing down and slows down so much. You breathe slower and slower. Your heart rate gets slower. You take a breath, and then you just never take another one. Your body never realizes it needs to take another breath. Um, and so this is, is one category. Uh, rufentanil, also known as roofies, is, is the kind of seen as the date rape drug. The reason rufentanil is used a lot of times is when you're on a downer, it slows you down. So um, it also lowers your inhibition so you can convince someone very easily to do something maybe they wouldn't have before. Also, um, you don't resist things as much or as easily. So it's easier for people to take advantage of someone. And then the big reason people use refentanols as the date rape drug is it causes retrograde amnesia. So basically from the time the drug enters your system till the time it leaves your system, um, it makes it so you can't remember or you don't have great clarity and detail on the events that occurred while that system was in your drug. And so that's there. Uh, our next category is central nervous system stimulants. So this is the opposite of our depressants. They would be considered uppers. Uh, so these things would be like amphetamines or, or methamphetamines, cocaine, crack cocaine, Ritalin. Um, and so these do the opposite of our depressants. Uh, they bring us up. These are our party drugs. We're going to take these when we want to go out on that on the town, be up for a number of hours, have better concentration and focus. Um, our ADHD medications are included in this, like Adderall and Ritalin. Um, and so all of these things are going on. And so uh, they're bringing that central nervous system up and increasing heart rate, making you hot and that type of thing. Um, they give you mental alertness, energy. They can make you nervous and make it where it's hard to sleep. Um, Long-term use, it can make it where you don't have energy without them, causes brain damage, uh, can cause heart palpitations. Um, again, be bad for unborn babies. Um, so you have all of these things going on in this particular categories. We do have things that would not be ever considered to have a good use, a, a pharmaceutical use prescribed by a doctor. Uh, one of these would be things like methamphetamine. Doctors do use amphetamines to kind of bring people up, but they're never going to use methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is basically grabbing everything under your kitchen sink, mixing it together and then smoking it or injecting it or whatever. Never going to be uh, something for that. Uh, crack cocaine, again, 
uh, not going to be a medical use, but cocaine is actually used medically in, in various scenarios. And as long as used appropriately, not a big deal. Um, names in here could be like speed, black beauties, uppers, crystal crank, meth, ice, all of those are just regional terms referring to methamphetamine. Um, you've got some of my favorite names in this category like Jif and Skippy. Uh, that's because those remind me of peanut butter and I just love peanut butter. Um, you've got things like candy, Coke, rock. Um, the, my all time favorite name for a street name is Toot. Uh, Toot is referring to, uh, cocaine. I've never heard of anyone using this particular one out in the street. Um, I've never been offered that, but if someone ever legitimately offered me toot, I would probably pee myself laughing just because I think it's the funniest name ever for a drug. Um, so uppers are kind of your party drug. Uh, downers, again, are your ones kind of when you, you just want to veg out and chill. And so what this causes people to do is sometimes they'll go out for a night to party. Um, they'll be taking cocaine or some kind of amphetamine. They'll be partying and then they get home and they're still kind of up and, and kind of increased. And so they may take, uh, take a downer, like a, a volume to try to lower themselves down so they can go to sleep. Mixing uppers and downers is very dangerous. People think that mixing them just causes them to be equal, back to resting, but they don't work this way. And so it's very likely that you overdose on this. And so you got to be very careful. Um, realize when it comes to central nervous system stimulants, so your uppers, if you overdose on them, you take too much, literally your heart's beating so fast and so consistently uh, that you eventually lead to uh, giving yourself a heart attack and that can kill you, actually stop your heart and kill you from um, having those uppers in too high of a dose. So we then have uh, marijuana and other cannabis products. So you've got marijuana itself, and then you have something called hashish, which is a byproduct from the marijuana production process. Uh, you smoke it, it gives you a very similar high to marijuana. It can be think uh, Mary Jane, reefer, skunk, weed, hash, boom, gangster. Hashish, realize, is more popular in uh, kind of your eastern, south, southern Europe than it is in America, but, but there is some uh, use of that. Um, marijuana gives you a euphoric feeling, kind of slows your reaction time and your thinking down, uh, can cause confusion, anxiety, impairs your balance and coordination, make it hard to think. Long term, it can reduce your memory, lower, uh, kill brain cells and, and reduce your retention of, of memorying things, uh, decrease your coordination and abilities um, and things like that can cause all kinds of psychological issues as well. Um, used to, we thought that you get an overdose of marijuana, but since it has become legal, which is one of the reasons we'll talk about marijuana is the fact that it has become legalized in States and all of Canada, you can now, uh, use marijuana products. Um, but because of that, it's happened. We've actually seen that you can overdose in, uh, marijuana products now. Uh, typically this is in the form of edibles, uh, and not typically in adults. So it's typically in kids. They find maybe some gummy bears that have a lot of marijuana in them. They think it's just regular candy and eat a large bag and then that builds up in their system and actually can cause their death. So it is something to be concerned with um, as we move forward and we're seeing with this, um, with marijuana becoming legal, we're starting to see more things about it. We're starting to learn more about the drug. We're seeing that it can be as dangerous as cigarettes, if not more. Uh, typically people don't smoke as many marijuana uh, products, so joints, whatever you want to call it, they don't smoke nearly as much the same quantity as they would tobacco smoke, but we do know the smoke itself is um, as dangerous or more dangerous than tobacco use, so it is something to be aware of. Marijuana, the product active ingredient, THC, is something that can be used in the medical community, I think has some good uses, just like a lot of these other uh, drugs that we've talked about. Um, however, it does only work for certain things. People are using it as a cure-all drug doesn't necessarily do that. Realize tobacco products 100, 150 years ago were prescribed as medicine because it was helpful, but we no longer, we know now that those aren't the case. And you would look at a doctor funny if they prescribed you tobacco. So marijuana is probably eventually going to follow suit in this. There's some things we can pull from it that are helpful, but your doctor should never tell you to smoke anything in order to, to make you healthier. We know that smoking anything, even if it's spinach leaves, is going to do damage on the inside of your body. So it is something for us to look at. Um, the next category we have is hallucinogens. Uh, hallucinogens um, have all kinds of, of things in this category from LSD to mescaline um, or peyote. Um, 
We've got uh, ketamine, PCP, MDMA, ecstasy. So you're talking about things like eating shrooms, which is what peyote is, um, licking toads, all kinds of names from acid, boomers, sunshines, special K, mushrooms, laughing gas, um, sorry, laughing gas, different one, angel dust, uh, peace pill, clarity. What hallucinogens do is they change how the mind works. So they interact with the mind. Uh, a lot of the drugs we saw up here are kind of de weight dependent, meaning the more you weigh, the more you need. When it comes to our hallucinogens, one dose is one dose for everybody for the most part. And so what they do is they alter the state of your mind. So realize what you're hearing and seeing right now is all interpreted by your mind. Um, and if we change that, things can act really funny. Uh, small doses can uh, maybe help you with um, or, or may just make it so you relax and you're kind of more open to ideas. But we know that typically most people taking hallucinogens, they can have all kinds of side effects because it's messing with the brain. So in a normal brain, you eat pizza, you taste pizza, you smell pizza, you kind of see pizza. And someone on LSD, they may go and eat a bite of pizza and instead of tasting pizza, maybe they hear trumpets playing and maybe they see uh, green circles in their vision. And if they are listening to music, instead of really hearing that music and being interpretive of that music, maybe they see uh, purple swirls and they uh, smell things like roasting marshmallows because the brain's not acting um, properly. Um, and so it does increase heart rate and blood pressure um, and can really change what you're seeing and how you interpret the, the world. You can overdose on hallucinogens, but typically people make poor choices on hallucinogens and this leads to, the, to their death. So maybe they're standing on a balcony on the 30th floor of a high rise and you guys would look off and see traffic down below and wouldn't you know, do anything stupid to jump off. But someone on a hallucinogen may look down instead of seeing a 300 foot drop into traffic, sees a giant field full of bunnies and just wants to kind of rub their face against the bunnies and would jump from that balcony leading to their death. Um, we know that long-term use of these can lead to psychosis and, and mental problems um, and just being able to tell what's, what's real and what's not real um, and can lead to all kinds of things. Realize that in this category, um, we do know that, that certain drugs in this category can be helpful with certain psychological problems and helping people to work through those. And we're starting to see a greater use of those, especially outside of America and treating uh, certain conditions. Finally, we have inhalants. Inhalants are things like solvents, aerosols, nitrates. So think about anything with a heavy smell, uh, Sharpies, gasoline, paint, anything with lots of fumes that could deprive the body of oxygen and introduce chemicals into the system. Uh, it can be called laughing gas, snappets, whippets. Um, you can get this from even whipped cream cans or compressed air. Uh, again, anything that you can breathe in, it's going to introduce chemicals into the blood and block oxygen. So whipped cream cans, you typically turn them upside down to get the delicious gold out of them. Um, but if you turn a whipped cream can upside right and uh, put that applicator in your mouth and just breathe in those gases that are released, it can uh, cause a high feeling. Um, it does disrupt brain function, so slurred speech, loss of motor coordination and consciousness. Uh, long term, it causes all kinds of long term organ damage. And we can't be more specific than that because there are lots of different solvents and depending on the chemicals in them, depends on what's going to happen inside the body. Um, inhalants aren't extremely wide used in America, but in third world countries, they're used a lot because it's a cheap way to get high. Uh, you can buy a small bottle of paint for next to nothing, uh, almost anywhere, but especially in third world countries. And they may put some paint on a rag and then hold it up to their nose and mouth and breathe that in until they start feeling high and then walk around for a little while. And as that high wears off, they continue to take that rag out of their pocket and breathe it in. And once that paint dries, they simply just add a little bit more paint and can get high for a long time. This does cause a lot of uh, brain damage and other things. If you're curious about this, um, this use and want to see kind of a documentary on it, there's a guy named Steve-O who used to shoot a lot of uh, shows on MTV. He created a document where um, he was addicted to drugs and he liked things like whippets and, and other inhalants. In his video, he shows um, what they do and, and kind of you see video of him on them and how they change his mood and, and what goes on. And he talks a lot about the usage and how uh, long term that affected him and even short term as well. And it's a really good video. Uh, it is kind of, um, I wouldn't watch it with any children. It can kind of be a little bit disturbing, uh, but it is a good thing to kind of introduce you and show you what's going on in that, in that area. 
So we've kind of covered these now. We've covered most of our, our categories. We, we do want to talk a little bit more as we go further about what's here. And so uh, when it comes to our drugs, uh, we do want to talk about who uses. So when we talk about it, really anyone can use drugs. And we know that everyone uh, uses drug from every kind of different group of people you can talk about, but we do know there are certain groups that are more likely to use drugs and abuse drugs and become addicted to drugs than others. What kinds of things do you think it makes it more likely that someone might be um, addicted or um, use drugs? So one example would be someone who's experienced maybe a lot of trauma. Yeah, especially early on in life, for sure. What else might be another thing that would lead to that? Uh, so depression, yeah. So if we, especially if we don't have the right ways to deal with depression and anxiety, yep. Yeah. What else? Yeah, our genetics also plays a role. So we know that if you have a history of addiction um, in your family, so maybe alcoholism, you're more likely uh, to be addicted to that. So those are great things. We know that uh, typically um, we've got mental disorders in general uh, can be associated with it for sure. Um, we know that typically the lower socioeconomic class that you're in uh, typically is more likely to use. So we typically would say that poorer people are more likely to use drugs. That doesn't mean people with a lot of money don't use them. It's just we tend to see it more in that. Uh, the earlier you were when you had your first sexual encounter makes you more likely to use. So um, if you had your first sexual encounter at a younger age, we know that you're more likely to use. Um, when was the first time you ex experimented with drugs or alcohol? The earlier on that was, the more likely it are, is that you'll use through the rest of your life. Um, we know that the lower your education level, the more likely it is for you to be able to use. So all of you guys being in college um, puts you at a little less likelihood of using <clears throat> and becoming addicted to drugs. Not impossible, just a little less likely. And so these are things that we have to consider. Realize not all drugs um, are considered drugs of uh, the poor. Uh, things like uh, your prescription narcotics, like um, hydrocodone, Vicodin, things like that, typically we see um, people of higher socioeconomic classes using, and also that of cocaine. Uh, cocaine is kind of thought of as a rich person's drug. Uh, it can be expensive, and we actually see the highest um, consumption of cocaine in the U.S. in our, rich, our richest areas of the U.S., so things like Wall Street in New York. People that are making lots of money are using a lot of cocaine, or Silicon Valley in California. Uh, those people tend to use more cocaine uh, than other places and they're making a lot of money. And so we have all of that, and so we have some concerns. Um, we have over-the-counter listed here, but we really ought to be saying prescription medications. Um, we know that prescription medications are becoming a bigger issue, especially in the opioid category. Um, this is for a variety of different reasons, from prescription, uh, people following what they use, and so we always say talk to your doctor and um, try to talk about this use. Don't just take what they say uh, for pain medication and follow it to the T. You may want to talk to them and then also consider that if you're not in pain, uh, don't take medic pain medications. They are good to utilize, but you want to utilize them sparingly as they can easily lead to an addiction. Um, marijuana, we've already kind of talked about with it becoming legal um, and what's coming on there. Um, we have synthetics and bath salts. So these are things that are meant to be used in a bath um, or synthetic kind of chemicals that people are smoking, trying to get high. They can cause you um, to get a similar high to that of marijuana or other drugs, but they're not regulated. Who knows what chemicals in the, are in them? They're all different. And so doing smoking some of these things can lead to um, some very bad problems because you never know what drugs you're introducing into the body and can cause people to kind of lose their minds and, and strip down their, all their clothes off and run around and kill people and maybe eat their flesh. And so synthetics and bath salts, we say stay away from because you never know what's in those and, and the chemicals in there can cause all kinds of reactions in the body. And then finally, we're seeing an increase in club drugs. So things like it could be roofies and, and date rape drugs, but also MDMA, LSD, ecstasy, that type of thing. Uh, people are more willing to experiment with those. Uh, they're more readily available. And this is uh, dangerous because 
um, you'll go use them occasionally and you may not realize um, how they're going to react in the body because you're, there's not a consistent use. We're not saying use more. We're saying don't use them. Uh, but also with those, they're being manufactured in a variety of different ways. And so one dose may react differently in the body than the next dose of something like ecstasy that you take. And so um, this is causing people to take more than what they think more of it because maybe the last dose they took didn't give them the same feeling they were looking for. And so the next time they go out, they, they take a double dose and, and it was a lot more potent and it's causing a lot of issues, especially when it comes to mental uh, capacities in that hallucinogen category. When it comes to treatment, um, there are lots of varieties of ways to treat it, um, depending on what drug it is and, and how extensive the use is. With uh, a lot of things we've talked about on that list before, uh, typically the best treatment course is to go to a rehabilitation facility where you can be monitored by doctors and, and given appropriate uh, psychological counseling to be successful. Uh, you can quit some of these on your own, but realize with a lot of the uh, more intense drugs uh, out there, Quitting on your own, especially cold turkey where you just cut it off 100%, uh, can be very dangerous and actually lead to death. And so we always uh, encourage you to talk to a doctor and talk to professionals before you do that. Um, in addition, psychological treatment is usually always needed with a drug addiction independence because there's something that may have led to that or uh, teaching you strategies to avoid it in the future is always important. So we have this, we, we've, we've talked about our drugs, um, but there's two things that we, we haven't talked about that you're probably the most likely to use and may have already started use. What do you think the two things are that um, you're most likely to use that we haven't talked about as it relates to kind of our drugs? Ooh, caffeine is a good one. Caffeine, we don't talk about too much, but it is a drug that most people are addicted to and, and causes that. People tend to leave it off the list surely because um, it tends not to be super life-threatening in, in, in consumption. Um, it's hard for us to consume that much. Can cause issues with our daily life. Um, let's think about some, some other things that um, typically you have to be 21 to consume these two products now. Tobacco. Tobacco is one of them. And what's the other one? Alcohol. Yeah, alcohol and tobacco, even though um, caffeine was a good idea as well. So with that, we do want to talk about alcohol consumption because, well, typically we see college students as uh, these huge alcohol consumers. So typically we think that um, most college students, as soon as class is over, are cracking beers and drinking through their entire day. Even though that might not be the case, we do want to talk about consumption of alcohol because you're more likely to um, start using alcohol or increase your alcohol consumption in college. When it comes to alcohol, it is seen as a poison in the body. Uh, we just, people tend to like the way that poison makes them feel is, is really what it comes down to. Um, it is a depressant, so it works just like our central nervous system depressants. It's a downer. It uh, slows you down and impairs coordination and thought process and reaction time. And if you consume too much of this, um, you literally, again, will just stop breathing. Uh, so someone who may be suspected of alcohol poisoning um, tends to be uh, they just literally stop breathing and they, they turn blue and, and have those issues. And so if you ever suspect someone of alcohol poisoning, there's not a whole lot you can do for them except to call 911 and take them to the hospital and let them take them to the hospital. Um, and what they'll do is while you're fully awake because they can't give you anything else because your nervous system is already depressed, they'll run basically a hose down your throat and suck out your stomach contents trying to uh, keep the alcohol from getting into your system and then they'll shove charcoal down that tube uh, all while you're fully awake and conscious. Um, not a very fun night in my opinion uh, when I think about it but if you want to do that you can. Um, realize there are laws in Georgia and most other states they're called uh, their laws for protecting people so currently in the state of Georgia if you are using drugs or consuming underage alcohol or anything of that sort, and there is a issue where someone needs medical attention, if you call 911, um, getting someone medical attention for an overdose, and everyone the ambulance arrives and cops show up, and they start trying to figure out what's going on, if you call 911 to help have someone, basically assist someone in an overdose or a medical emergency related to drugs, you can actually not be charged with use or possession of that drug. So if you're drinking under 21 and one of your friends gets alcohol poisoning and you call 911 and the cops show up, 
Um, they cannot charge you with underage drinking um, because you called to give someone help. So they may try to charge you, but it wouldn't hold up in a court of law. Um, same thing goes with all drugs. So if you're using heroin, you're at a party, someone overdoses, uh, you call 911, cops show up. Um, you can't be charged with possession of that heroin because you were getting someone assistance. Now they can take that heroin and whatnot and have someone come get you, that type of thing, but they can't charge you with the possession of it. And so that's a really good thing to encourage people to call and get people help. Um, when it comes to alcohol, we measure how much alcohol is in your system by what we call your BAC or your blood alcohol content. Um, the more alcohol um, that's in your blood, the more effects you feel and the more likely it is for you to have problems with it. But the way that alcohol builds up in the blood, um, there's a few things you have to account for. So first of all, it is weight dependent. So weight dependent means that the more you weigh, the more alcohol you need uh, in order to raise that blood alcohol content. So if we have a 100 pound person and a 200 pound person and each of them has one alcoholic drink, the person that weighs 200 pounds may only see their blood alcohol content go up to 0.01% where someone who's 100 pounds might see their alcohol content, blood alcohol content go up to 0.02%. And so with every drink, the person who weighs less, their blood alcohol is going to go up higher and higher. And this can make a difference as you are drinking. It's also time dependent, meaning uh, the quicker you drink those drinks, the higher your blood alcohol is going to go. So if you drink two beers over the course of two hours, it's, it's not going to go up very high. But if you drink two beers over the course of 15 minutes, your blood alcohol content is going to go up higher and you're going to have more adverse health effects from that. Um, tends to be that females out blood alcohol contents rise quicker than males. That's another thing. Um, if you have food in your stomach, uh, it, it, your blood alcohol content rises slower. If you're dehydrated, um, your blood alcohol content rises faster. So there's a lot of factors. And so do you guys know how, how it's recommended that if you're going to consume alcohol, how, how you should consume alcohol? Like what's the recommendation for alcohol consumption? Do you guys know what that is? Is it like a drink per hour? Yeah. So typically what we say is that if you're going to drink, you want to drink one drink, um, have one drink every hour or no more than one drink in each hour. Uh, you'd want to consume that drink with food is, is another thing as well. And so one drink an hour um, or no more than one drink an hour and no more than three drinks in any one sitting. So we would say if you're at a party for uh, three or four hours, even though you may be there for four hours, you don't want to consume more than three drinks in any one sitting and no more than one drink every hour. Um, and this is the appropriate way to drink. Some of you may be thinking, well, that doesn't seem uh, like it's going to, you know, get me the results I want. It may not, but this is the safe way to drink and um, a way for um, you to maintain safe and a recommended way to drink. And so that's kind of there. Um, realize you shouldn't drink and drive. Um, states are now cutting harder and harder lines on, on how much alcohol you can have and actually drive. Um, so basically, if you're ever going to have a drink, have someone drive you home that hasn't been drinking or um, uh, call a taxi or an Uber or something like that. Uh, don't risk it. It does not do good. It's not safe. Um, it's not a good game to play. It does cause lives to be lost every year. Um, and it's just something that's very dangerous. Uh, if you ever go into a career where you have to drive around things like fuel or like radioactive material, have a hazmat license there, or if you drive a big rig, there are even more strict instructions on how much alcohol you can have in your system and drive. But we say just don't do it. Um, if you have one drink and it's been two or three hours, sure, you can probably drive home. But if you've had three or four drinks in the course of three hours, we say that just get a ride home because that's very dangerous for lots of people involved. Um, and so, um, also don't let someone who's been drinking, try to convince you that they can drive. I've been in this scenario, had a friend who said they were fine. We got in the car and he bland, ran, literally ran through two red lights. Um, and I told him to stop and let me drive. I hadn't been drinking. Uh, he refused at first. And so I literally was getting ready to jump out of the car, uh, at about 30 miles an hour, uh, because he was going to get us killed. Uh, and he finally pulled over and this was a very scary scenario and something that you shouldn't have to go through. So don't let someone convince you of that. 
Um, Short-term effects uh, can cause loss of memory, uh, can cause vomiting, can lead to death. Um, we kind of talked about those. Long-term effects, you can damage your liver, uh, can make it hard for you to remember things, um, can affect your stomach and your intestines and lead to cancer. So just be aware of that. Um, when it comes to college students, college students do consume large amounts of alcohol, uh, but they don't consume it in the way that most people think all the time. What we mostly see from our college students is they tend to be binge drinkers. Do you guys know what binge drinking is? Is it just where you like consume a lot, just a lot? Yeah, so over drinking or consuming a lot in one sitting. So binge drinking is defined as five or more drinks in a single sitting or outing. So if you go to a party and you consume five drinks, um, we would cons even if it's over the course of, of four or five hours, um, we would tend to call that binge drinking. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of drinks all at once are in a short period of time frame. Um, so what we typically see with a lot of college students is they may not drink Sunday through Thursday. But then when Friday and Saturday hits, they're going to, to clubs or parties or whatever, and they're consuming a whole lot of drinks in, in one evening. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 drinks in, in an evening or through the course of a party. And this is very dangerous because it puts, it raises your blood alcohol content um, in, in a very, to a very high level. Uh, has a lot of alcohol in your system. And also with this kind of breaking and drinking and then coming back, you're more likely to overdose from it because you consume too much and don't know where you need to stop because it's building up in your system so quickly. Um, and so this can lead to misuse and disordered drinking, uh, which is where you're using it at appropriate times and, and kind of that addiction process. I want to try to avoid this by, by using correct habits and drinking so that this doesn't happen. Uh, if you have a history of alcoholism in your family, we know that you're more likely for this to happen. And so you may just want to stay away from alcohol altogether. Um, alcohol runs in my particular family. I have multiple family members that are alcoholics. And so um, I'm very careful with alcohol. I don't, I don't drink it very often. I'm more of a, um, I have, I like to try things just to see what they kind of taste like. Um, and so I'll have a drink of someone else's drink or, or order one thing that's kind of different that I've never seen before. Um, but I rarely drink just because it's very likely in my family that I could be addicted to it. And so it's smarter just to stay away from that. Um, so with that being said, we have talked about one drink. We use that word a lot when it comes to alcohol, one drink, one drink, this like uh, one drink in an hour. Well, realize one drink is talking about how much alcohol is in something. And so when we think about one drink, well, what is one drink for a beer versus one drink for a shot versus one drink for a margarita? Do they all count the same or, or what? And so we have this chart here uh, that kind of lays it out for us. And it all basically is based on alcohol content. So one drink, if we're talking about a regular beer, something like Bud Light, PBR, whatever, um, is about a 12 ounce beer that's around 5% alcohol. That's your standard beers around 5% alcohol. And a 12 ounce beer would be considered one drink. As the alcohol content goes up, the amount of liquid you drink goes down. So something like a malt liquor uh, would be something like Mike's Hard Lemonade, maybe around 7% alcohol. You'd only want to consume about eight to nine ounces of it, and that would count as a drink. Um, you do have to be careful because now with all the beers out there, there are beers that easily hit 7% alcohol, and they come in 12-ounce cans, and that's over, a one ounce, that's over one drink in a 12-ounce can. You'd actually only want to consume about eight ounces of this. And so people are starting to get more than one drink in their average serving. Um, things like your table wine. So your, your, um, uh, not a huge wine person, but your Cabernets and your, uh, Marlowe's and, and whatever else, your Chardonnay's and, um, those types of things. Uh, your typical table wine is about 12% alcohol. And so you only want to drink about five ounces of it. And this is what it looks like in a normal wine glass, not all the way up to the rim, not a whole bottle is one drink, but simply five ounces because all this is giving the same amount of alcohol. Um, as you start to get higher and higher alcohol percentages, um, they're typically at the low level measured in percent alcohol. So most of your beers say percents. Um, but as you start to get a little bit higher over this 12% mark, they start measuring it in proof. And so proof is just double the percentage. So if you have an alcohol that says that it's um, 20 proof, what that means is that it's 10% alcohol. If it's 40 proof, it means it's 20% alcohol. 
realize beers can be up into the the 12 and, and 20% category now for the amount of alcohol. And so with each of those, it, the consumption should go down in the amount that you're consuming, even though it typically does not. And so you're getting multiple drinks in, in one. Um, fortified wines such as sherries and ports, uh, three to four ounces of about a 17% alcohol. Um, you have things like your cordils and your liquors, kind of your dessert kind of things like um, Bailey's is typically this. Uh, they're about 24% alcohol or 50 to 40 to 50 proof. Uh, you only need two, two to three ounces. And then um, in your things like brandy um, or your hard liquors like tequila, whiskey, that type of thing, um, we typically say a single shot or jigger. So a jigger is that little uh, silver cup you see them measuring with at bars. Um, about one and a half ounces is considered one drink of a 40% uh, percent alcohol or 80 proof liquor. Most liquors tend to be around 80 proof, most of your common ones out there. Um, but realize you can get liquors that are higher. So things like Bacardi 151. The 151 in Bacardi 151 stands for 151 proof, meaning that it is 75% alcohol, meaning that you only need about half to three quarters of an ounce to be measured as a drink. Uh, if you get something called Everclear, Everclear can be like 195 proof, which means that it's like 99 to 95 and a half percent alcohol, uh, of pure alcohol. And so with that, you need very, very little for that to be considered a drink. Uh, and so you do have to keep that in mind. If we're talking about mixed drinks like a margarita, a margarita should only have about one shot of tequila in it. That would be a typical drink for that. If it's stronger than that, and it could count as more than one drink. Does all this make sense so far? Can you explain the proofing again? Yeah, proofing. So if when you get up into your liquors and, and some of your stronger strengths, um, what you'll see on the bottle is you won't see like a percent alcohol. It won't say like 17% alcohol. It'll say something like 40 proof. Um, and so 40 proof is basically, if you take the proof and divide it by two, we'll give you your percentage. So if you have 40 proof, that means that it's 20% alcohol. If you see something that says 80 proof, it's 40% alcohol. Um, 100 proof is 50%. And so a something that's 100% alcohol, basically pure alcohol, would be labeled as 200 proof. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Awesome, not a problem. And so. This kind of lets us know what, what one drink is, and so you can kind of see that and, and judge that as you move forward. So um, now that we've, 